thank you. Yesterday I gave a research seminar on a highly technical problem with a lot of difficult mathematical details. Today is different. It's uh, a wide-ranging survey of the behavior of um, elastic liquids. It um, will have very little technical detail. There is a lot of technical detail of work that's been done, but I'm not going to mention it and go to that level in the presentation. And it involves the work of uh, many people, many papers over many years. And uh, I'm trying to synthesize what we've learned about this subject and give a review of the flow dynamics of liquids which have an elastic element in them. So the first question is, what are they? Where, are, where do you come across them? And you will have all come across them once today, if not twice. So um, you would have uh, used toothpaste. Um, it's rather nice that toothpaste is solid when it's sitting on the brush, but it's rather nice that it's liquid when you brush your teeth. Um, equally, shampoo. There are some shampoos which start as a gel, um, which stay on your hand until they get on your head, and it wouldn't be good if they were a solid on your head. You'd like them to become liquid. Um, uh, the soups that you have here, they're quite elastic. If you stir them and then let go, uh, take your spoon out, they'll actually bounce back a little. Um, you all know of the problem of getting ketchup out of a bottle, that it's quite solid and you have to induce it to flow. And um, there are more important uh, commercial applications in the production of synthetic fibers. Um, and plastic bags, we have too many of those, but how do you produce a plastic bag going from a, um, a liquid state to a solid? Unfortunately, the liquid is rather elastic in the time. I've been interested in inkjet printing, and I'll show you, uh, there's a problem in inkjet printing. The drops arrive on the paper rather fast, at about five meters a second, and sometimes they go splat, and that's not a very nice drop to have on the... Um, uh, paper, so we add things to it to stop it going splashing. Um, but then, well, that can go wrong. Um, I was involved with uh, um, the oil fields. When you drill an oil well, you use a magic liquid to, um, in order that the rock cuttings don't fall to the bottom but can be transported up. So th there are they're, they're, these complex liquids are found in many places. You can ask, why are they complex? Water isn't, air isn't. Why should these materials be complex? And there is a simple explanation that they have a microstructure of the size of about a micron. Water and air have a, um, a micro, well, water has a microstructure of the size of a nanometer, and it has vibrations and relaxation processes on the time scale of a nanosecond. So the relaxation to equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium, is uh, proportional to the volume. And if you go from nano to micron, a factor of a thousand, the volume changes by a factor of um, 10 to the 9, and so the, re the relaxation time changes to a second, and that's interesting to us. That's a human time scale rather than in these nanosecond um, uh, of uh, water. So this is uh, why these materials um, do behave not like water. So there is quite a number of different types of uh, complex fluids, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about those which have an elastic element. Um, I'm not going to talk about the shear thinning. Um, I believe the physics of shear thinning is rather easy, uh, and yield fluids are an example of shear thinning. Um, with the exception of the seminar I gave yesterday, I really, well, I always used to believe this, and then I had a research student who worked far too hard on a very difficult problem I talked about yesterday. So it's not quite true that shear thinning is boring and very simple, but mostly it is. I'm going to be today talking about the elastic materials. And uh, we've come to a state in the last uh, five or so years where we know what happens um, uh, reproducibly. So two things, one in the experiments and one in the computing. The experiments have become uh, reproducible. Um, in this subject uh, 30 years ago, 
Um, one lab would make an experiment and see something interesting. Another lab would make this, a similar sort of experiment and see a similar sort of thing, but it wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't quantitatively the same. And so it was difficult to do science if you don't have reproducible experiments. And uh, we s um, had a um, campaign um, some years ago with a standardized liquid, which was, it was called uh, M1. You can think M1 stands for Magic Liquid 1 because it was produced by Monash University in Melbourne. So it's very M1 fluid. This, they manufactured um, lots of bottles of it and sent to different labs, a dozen labs throughout the world. And we all measured the properties of this material and mostly agreed. And then we went and did experiments and the, f saw the same phenomena at the same numbers. So we had reproducible experiments. And since that, um, there's been a, a protocol of dis describing very much your liquid so other people can manufacture it and um, uh, repeat your experiments. So For the uh, fluids, uh, collision time could be the time scale, if my eight microscope. But for how, how do you get one second? I'm, it's not clear to me. Uh, this um, could you just explain a bit more? Uh? Yes, you use the I Stokes Einstein diffusion formula, which says uh, describes what the um, uh, this diffusivity, which is kT upon six pi mu a, one length scale, and you ask to diffuse through the length of the particle. Uh, so the time is a squared divided by the diffusivity. Okay. So it's proportional so it's to the volume. The, length, uh, the diffusion length has increased for these fluids. Is that uh, correct? No, they have lumps in them, okay. microstructure, the size of a I micron. See. I see, I see. Thank you. Okay. So while the experiments were becoming repro reproducible, also the computing was becoming reproducible. There were lots of uh, different methods. Everyone had their best method. Um, and they didn't like other people's methods, and they all gave rather similar results, but not quantitatively the same result. And it, it got very difficult to say uh, what was right. Uh, and so we set up five benchmark problems. They were published. What you had to cu calculate the flow past a sphere in a tube, which was radius twice of it, for example. And you had to calculate the flow down a wavy wall tube, and the amplitude of the wave was given as half the radius, and the wavelength was given as two radii. And uh, you, you had to try and compute these. And after about five years, different programs, uh, uh, when they were corrected, um, got the same answers. So we, we arrive at a situation where we know what happens in the real world, and we can all reproduce it, and we can compute to some extent. Not the computations don't necessarily uh, reproduce the real world answers. And while we know what happens in different uh, situations, you can then, and it's nice to know what happens, you then want to lift the level of scientific discussion above what happens to why does it happen? What are the underlying reasons? And try and generate uh, a system of insights of what's going on, which have a, then a greater generality. You can go to new situations and have an expectation of what might happen. So this talk is all about trying to um, find out what are the underlying reasons for things happening. Um, so. These liquids, which are, have an elastic property, um, are slightly elastic and slightly viscous. And it turns out that they are more than just being elastic plus viscous. So in for viscous liquids, we are, or viscous fluids, we have a whole series of understandings. We know about the Bernoulli pressure distribution. If you're going slow here and fast here, you need a higher pressure here than here. Therefore, we know that when you have an aerofoil and the fluid has to go fast over the top, in order to go faster over the top, you need a lower pressure on the top of it. And therefore, because there's a lower pressure on the top of the aerofoil, there is lift on the airframe, on the airfoil. 
So we are, we've developed those ideas of flow of viscous uh, fluids. Uh, we know about waves that there are in fluids. We know about viscous boundary layers. Uh, we know how to calculate stability. And we have seen a lot of turbulence, and we understand it a bit. Um, so we, we have a series of understandings of a library of ideas about the behavior of viscous liquids. And equally for elastic solids, we have, uh, over the uh, 100 plus years, developed some understanding. I suppose it's the, in the 19th century, well, you could argue the Romans run, uh, understood structures a bit. We know how to produce these long bridges um, of structures and how, to, how buildings, if you just build in rectangles, the things shear over. You need cross ties and things like this. So we understand structures um, for in elastic solids. Um, the finite element numerical method was developed for elastic solids. We've used it now in many other subjects, but it works very well in the hyperbolic mathematical equations of elasticity, and it was developed for that. And it does, it's pretty atrocious, uh, finite elements in hyperbolic equations, although not many people uh, believe that, or understand that. So in elastic solids, we know about the waves, the seismic waves. We use elastic solids, uh, el waves, uh, surface waves um, that run along a, a surface to detect whether there's a crack or not. So if you've got a piece of metal with a crack, the uh, surface waves, if they have short frequency, have to go along down the crack and uh, come up the crack and then back along the surface. We can, therefore, by working out how long it takes to get from one end to the other, we can detect is it a, s a simple flat surface or is there a crack? And then uh, modern materials, we have uh, lots of new prop possibilities of light materials which are strong or pro materials which have good heat capacity. Uh, but um, have other different properties by using composite materials in um, elastic solids. So we have this library of ideas of understanding elastic solids. Unfortunate bad news is that the viscoelastic materials, the elastic liquids, are more than that. They do strange things. So they are not halfway between and a viscous behavior in elastic. If you were given a new situation, if you said, well, I know what a viscous liquid does and what an elastic solid does, so I guess that halfway in between it does this, it probably does the opposite. It does a number of curious things. And therefore, there is a real need to develop an understanding of the behavior. OK, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you uh, four um, strange behaviors which we'll get to a, an explanation of later. Um, there are quite a number of other phenomena floating in and out at later parts of the talk. But I'm going to uh, present four and follow them through, developing slowly an understanding of them. Um, I'm going to, uh, as I am a mathematician, I will sh show you the simplest possible um, mathematical description of an elastic liquid. It happens to be called Oldroyd B. Oldroyd A is rubbish, and Oldroyd B is not bad. And we'll ask whether this simplest possible um, model, mathematical model of a viscoelastic liquid, works for these phenomena. And the answer is, um, it's about half right. It half predicts what goes on. It fails to predict certain features. And then if you think about why has it failed, you can then move on to a modification. And there's a modification which is called Feeney. So there are alternatives to the simplest possible. There are alternative modifications. But I'm going to tell you about the Feeney one and see whether that, um, fortunately, does correct the shortcomings of the old rugby. It was designed to correct the, uh, the bad behaviors of this material. And it then introduces new ideas about uh, anisotropy of materials and stress boundary layers. Um, and then, when I get to the conclusions, we can pull everything together and see that we're developing an understanding of why the fluids have these different behaviors. OK, so flows to a um, uh, 
uh, explained. I'm in going to be interested in a contraction flow, flow from a wide channel into a, low, into a narrow channel. The flow has to contract. What happens? I'm going to be interested in flow past the sphere as a theoretician's uh, obsession with spheres, uh, but it is something that people have computed. Um, I'll tell you about the M1 um, project. This is m magic liquid number one. It was very good in shear flow, but extensional viscosities um, didn't f sit into a simple pattern, fit into a simple pattern. And then there's um, something called capillary squeezing of a uh, liquid filament, which I'll tell you about. So, in more detail, these four th uh, f strange flows. This is a contraction flow from a wide channel through a into a small channel, and um, at uh, high Reynolds numbers, if the flow was coming out of a narrow channel into a wide channel, you'd expect to see some downstream vortices. But this is strange. This is in elastic liquid and you see upstream vortices. Water, the water would just come straight down and through there in some conical flow. Here there are these big upstream vortices and they're a disaster if you're trying to make nylon fibers. So the way we make nylon fibers is you have something like a shower head. You actually have a hundred shower heads with little holes in and you, pre you, with a rather high pressure, push goo out of these um, uh, uh, little um, uh, um, holes and then you, you do various things about cooling it down and stretching it. But if upstream of the nozzle there was this recirculation of this hot chemical, it will change its temperature and it will change its chemical composition while it's circulating round there. So the material coming through will be different to this stuff, this material that is stuck in the recirculating eddies. Then if there's a pressure fluctuation, some of this will come out. And your fiber will be slightly different, be made of a different material. It'll be made of the material that's been cooking away here. And I did actually have this problem brought to me by Courtauld. So it used to be a manufacturer of uh, nylon and visco viscose. Um, fibers, um, they couldn't make the dye stick on the fiber. There are places it couldn't stick on the fiber. And it was the cooked material here that if it came, came out, it produced a bit of fiber that you couldn't stick dye on. So it is a serious commercial problem. And associated when these, with these large uh, recirculating eddies, if you look at the pressure drop as a function of flow rate, you find that the pressure drop suddenly jumps up by two orders of magnitude, by an order of magnitude. So associated with these recirculating eddies, there's an extra pressure drop, and that's maybe more than you can supply. So that's the contraction flow. Flow past the sphere is le slightly less dramatic. Here are the velocities um, as a, on the axis in front of the um, uh, sphere and behind the sphere. And you can see comparing the front with the back, there is a long wake, even though the Reynolds number is small. Normally at zero Reynolds numbers, zero inertia, these are very viscous materials. At low inertia, the, the flow downstream is symmetric to the flow upstream. Here there is a large wake forming behind. We'll see much more of that later. And there is a, experimentally, there's a slight increase, 20%, 30% in the drag on the object associated with this uh, existence of the long wake. Um, there's also a phenomenon of um, negative wakes. So the negative wake is Get this right. If we're going along here, okay, so the fluid at infinity is still, and we're going along, we, our sphere moves through it, then actually the material behind it is moving just a bit slower than the sphere, but moving in the direction of the sphere. For these strange liquids, you can find that the sphere moves this way and the fluid behind it is going in the opposite direction. A negative weight. In places. Right, the M1 project was very good at measuring the um, uh, 
sheer viscosity. Everyone agreed within a few percent of one another. Um, when they came to measure the stretching viscosity, the extensional viscosity, by eight different methods, um, they gave eight different answers. And you can see it's an entire scatter plot. Over two decades here, we're f spreading a range of um, five decades vertically. So what is the extensional viscosity? We have, uh, all you can deduce from this mess is that there are jolly high stresses in extensional flows, but you've no idea what the viscosity is. So we have to sort this problem out, and we will. Ah, yes, now the capillary squeeze. Okay, so um, there's a phenomena where if you had a, a, a little th filament of... Um, uh, these elastic liquids and surface tension uh, is trying to squeeze it and will stretch it, it happens that it stretches it rather slowly. So I have a sample of um, these elastic liquids with me in my mouth, saliva. Saliva is, has is water plus a lot of protein. So if I produce a little drop of this and put it between my finger and thumb, I will then stretch it and we'll see what happens. So this doesn't always ha work. It depends on the sort of condition of my mouth today. Okay, so I'm stretching it, and uh, it's not going to work. Okay, it is existing now, now, now. There's a little bridge there, and if I try and open it up a bit more, it's still there. It, it was there for several seconds. Water, it goes away in a millisecond. Okay, so I challenge you to try this quietly on your own. <laughs> and I can assure you, if you do it with water, you don't see anything. It breaks faster than the response of the visual system. But, um, and for the, um, more, the polymer solutions, you can actually put your finger in it there and walk across the stage, and this filament just stays there. It's a real nuisance that it hangs around. So a practical case where it's a is a problem is in that some uh, anti-splat, if we add polymer to uh, an inkjet printer, this is a part of a drop on demand. That means there are little squeezing things behind the nozzle sending out drops when we want them. And there's a bank of 120 of these, 28 nozzles sideways, and we can program each nozzle sort of independently. So th this has been programmed to come out first, then afterwards that drop, and after that drop. The, the nozzle plate is up there, and uh, you can see that um, there are these long um, filaments which are being squeezed by surface tension, but they will not go away. And worse than that, they, they do produce little drops, but they, I can see there is a very fine line. Can you see that? Yes, there's a very fine line of liquid connecting those. And this is hopeless for printing. You can't print like this. So there's a limit, and in fact, part of our study in a m big collaboration we've had working on local in with local inkjet printing companies is to work out how much polymer additive you can put to the ink, which will stop the splatting, but will uh, still allow good jetting rather than that bad jet jetting. Okay, so these are the flows which will come back time and time again, which we're going to explain why do they behave like that. So I do need some equations, and they're just symbolic equations like that. I obviously have to conserve mass. Um, uh, I want to conserve momentum, although in most cases inertia is small. I do have a stress in these materials. And then to complete the set, I have to relate the stress to the flow. It's actually differences in velocity, um, uh, so velocity gradients that matter. And it's not the necessarily the velocity gradient now, but the velocity gradient in the past. It has These materials have a memory. So I would like to, I need a relationship there. And while I know the conservation laws, everyone knows conservation laws of mass and momentum, no one knows the constitutive relation, how, what, how is the stress related to the strain rate. 
So at this stage, you become an applied mathematician and you consider a model. So it's not known what it is exactly, um, and measuring it is just impossible, too much to measure. So we start with the possible model, and I claim that is the old droid B. And it's the simplest combination of some viscous effects and some elastic effects, and it is this. We say that the stress, there's a bit of pressure because they're incompressible, um, and there's a viscous stress and there's an elastic stress. So the viscous stress is just like an ordinary viscous liquid. There's a viscosity and there's a strain rate, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. Uh, so strain rate times viscosity gives me a viscous stress. And there's an, to that we add an elastic stress, just add it. And that we will have an elastic modulus and times the de deformation of the material. So I have the material in this uh, yellow A that is, uh, measures how much the material is deformed, and it's deformed according to an equation that says, and I'm going to explain this a bit better in a minute, it first part says it, if it, there is flow, flow stretching the microstructure, it will um, deform the microstructure. On the other hand, it would re like to relax back to the isotropic state an isotropic tensor. So A would really like to be 1, I, or, and it will get there on a time scale of this relaxation time, while at the same time, if there is flow, the flow is stretching um, the A, and the stretched flow will produce a, an elastic stress multiplied by the elastic modulus. So this model, unfortunately, which is the simplest, has three parameters in it. We have a viscosity. I'm going to call this the base viscosity or the, uh, the base viscosity, and an elastic modulus, and it has a time scale, a relaxation time, that it's um, for the material. Right. So let me try and explain how this deformation with the flow. What, why should th that be expressed in that particular mathematical form? And I remind you of elementary continuum mechanics. If you have a flow field, kinematics, and you label two points near to, to the one another in a flow, and uh, say they both move with the flow exactly, what happens to this material element? Well, firstly, it gets translated. But then, because of a difference in the velocity between the top and the bottom, it's, if it's going faster sideways compared with the bottom, it will rotate around. Alternatively, if it's going upwards faster here than here, it will stretch. And that is uh, the difference in the velocity between the two ends is the directional derivative of the velocity in the direction of the element. So that's how material is stretched by the flow. A line is stretched by the flow. And now I need a, a second order tensor for to, to have stress. I want to talk about stress, I need a second order tensor. So I just ask for two copies of this line element, and then one uh, side will be stretched just like that, and then the other side is stretched like that. So both thing, parts are being stretched. So that is how we have this form here. It is just saying the material is being stretched entirely by the flow, and this term here says, well, hey-ho, I don't like that. I would like to relax to the equilibrium state. OK, so you're used to having um, uh, an elastic solid or a viscous fluid. The new thing, pro and it turns out to be the important thing, is a relaxation of the, uh, uh, of the material. And having a new time means that we have a new non-dimensional group, which is called the Debra number. And it is the ratio of the, the fluid's relaxation time to the flow time. So that's the time it takes to travel a distance L at speed u. And that's, um, uh, that's the time scale in the flow. And this is the time scale of the material. And the ratio of those is called the Debra number because the people who were originally interested in this knew their Bible very well. They were Jewish, 
and uh, there's something about the mountain coming to the prophet or the prophet coming to the mountain all hinging on the time scale you're prepared to look at. We know the mountains look solid on human time scales, but if you come back in oh, 100,000 years, the mountain will have changed. So all the matter of what time scale you want to think about life. Um, and um, So this ratio of time scales is called the Debra number. And it pops up from time to time. So if the Debra number is very small, that means that the relaxation time is very short. It means that very rapidly it relaxes. It's a very relaxed situation. And that's when you get, normally, you get liquid-like behavior. That's what happens. Uh, water has a relaxation time of 10 to the minus 9 uh, nano, 10 to the 9 seconds. And so it's totally relaxed. It's sitting in, therm in relaxed thermodynamic equilibrium. On the other hand, um, if the uh, time scale is very long, it doesn't bother to relax. It's not, there's hardly any relaxation going on. And the materials that don't relax are called elastic solids. So this Debra number tells us whether we're going to get liquid-like behavior, solid-like behavior, and um, it, therefore it has an importance. Okay, so we, this is this uh, simple model, and the key question is, does this simple model work, or does it fail? And the answer is half and half. So, um, I'm not going to do this. I'm just putting this slide up to say that, actually, if, you've looked, if you look at what people have done in the last uh, 20 odd years, they have done all possible mathematical limits. So there are mathematical studies, there are experiments in different regimes, there are computations in different regimes, there are a few analytic studies in different regimes, and these are the different regimes, whether the flow is, um, the <coughs> time scale is um, small compared with the relaxation time, whether the shear rate is small compared with the relaxation time, or perhaps it's bigger, um, uh, situations where the elastic stresses are bigger than the viscous stresses. So we've scanned all of those possibilities. And um, I'm s the most important statement on this is I'm going to suppress all of the mathematical details that about those possible analyses and all the numerical calculations. The, the com numerical calculations are very seriously difficult and take a long a lot of computational time. And I'm not going to tell you about the methods. So, uh, the first lesson um, is what happens if the flows are relatively weak. It's a regime called linear viscoelasticity. It's common to all materials which have relaxation, and not necessarily my model uh, material, my old Roid B model. So, my simplest model will behave like this, but any other more complicated uh, mathematical model of the rheology will behave in the same way. And what happen, it's interesting to think out what happens as a function of time if the shear rate is zero. We suddenly switch on a shear rate, hold it constant, and then we suddenly switch the shear rate off. So we are going to impose a flow starting from nothing, a constant shear rate, and then switch off to constant nothing. What happens to the stress? So the stress jumps immediately, the shear starts. It's a viscous response. And then there is a slow, on the time scale of the relaxation, there's a slow re, uh, movement to equilibrium, a steady state. And then when we switch the flow off, there's an immediate jump of exactly the same amount. And then there is, when there's no flow, there is a slow relaxation on the time scale of the relaxation. Okay, it's very important to understand that. So, as I said, there's a viscous response early on, which is the stress is equal to the, this um, base shear rate. This, um, so I'm now going to call it the early time viscosity. Um, uh, <coughs> that's the immediate response to a sudden change, the immediate response to a sudden change there. There's then a steady state viscosity, which is higher, which is the base viscosity plus the elastic modulus times the relaxation. Elastic modulus times the relaxation time is a viscosity. 
And that's the steady state viscosity. And you see it takes a certain time to build up to the steady state. And how much stress do you get in this um, <coughs> from the elastic element of the constitutive equation? Well, the steady deformation is the shear rate times how much you can remember. So if you take the shear rate and can only remember back one relaxation time. After a relaxation time, you've forgotten what was happening. So if you multiply the two together, this is the rate at which you're building up deformation. This is how long you've got to remember. The product will be the um, deformation. And then if we multiply the deformation by the elastic modulus, sorry, you don't want that blue for the minute. Um, if you multiply this shear rate, times the relaxation time, times the elastic modulus, you get a stress, which is the elastic modulus times the uh, relaxation time, and then mo that stress is multiplied by the shear rate. It's a viscosity. So we can understand. This is linear behavior in this simple flow. And as I said, any constitutive equation would give exactly this in the linearized regime. So it's possible to drift off into the nonlinear regime, and we'll get to some of that later. OK, so this stress relaxation is a very special uh, property of non-Newtonian fluids complex fluids that is not present in elastic solids, is not present in viscous fluids, and it's the key to why they are behave in a curious way. Okay, so let's take this, uh, um, uh, this idea that it takes time to build up to the steady state to some steady flows. So look at the contraction flow. Now people have computed numerically for this constitutive equation, for this old Roy B model equation, they've calculated the behavior in a contraction. And while the flow is steady at any one point, for the fluid going through the contraction, it's obviously a transient behavior. This, if you sit on the fluid, it starts with no, no interesting flow and goes through the contraction um, and sees a developing flow. So it's a time-dependent flow for the material, even though it's steady at every single point. It's Lagrangian unsteady. And so various people have calculated um, this is essentially the pressure drop as a function of flow rate, and they sort of agree. You, you can see that they don't actually agree. Um, this was during the time when different codes gave different answers. They now will agree, although... They probably, there's probably a good reason why they should actually be going wrong here, because there doesn't exist the steady flow for this, then, um, for this model equation. But up here, they ought to agree. OK, so that's, uh, we can understand, uh, now, we can, uh, OK. So this um, uh, non-dimensional pressure drop has been non-dimensionalized using the steady viscosity. I told, I told you that the flow actually sees the, the uh, going through the, uh, the nozzle, through the orifice, the contraction, as a transient activity. And if we go through it fast, faster than the relaxation time, then it doesn't have time to get to the steady state. And therefore, if we go through fast, we should see the early time viscosity. And the early time viscosity, the pressure drop due to a less viscous liquid, will be less pressure drop. So the explanation of why the pressure drop decreases um, as, a f as you go faster is that you shouldn't have used the steady state viscosity. You should have used the early time viscosity in a transient flow. OK, so that's what happens in the, com the numerical solutions. And if, let's see what happens in the experiments. Well, I showed you this before. If you look very carefully, you can see the pressure drop does decrease, as in the computing. So in that model liquid, we get this bit right. We, of course, fail to get that bit right. 
So this is a half a 50% success rate. Um, the uh, experiments have a t do have a drop in pressure, uh, do have a decrease in the pressure drop, um, but the old Roid B does not have the big increase. So this is a failure of that simple model, and there are no big upstream vortices for this model. So it's a second failure. So two failures of the model. The correct that it gets a slight decrease. So if we go f to flow past a sphere, again it's a transient flow that the fluid coming round the sphere um, w was in equilibrium and then suddenly it's taken out of equilibrium and it's, um, uh, it's seeing a varying flow and then it goes back to equilibrium. And um, while the flow at any one point is steady, the, the material experience a transient flow, it's Lagrangian unsteady. And again, if we look at the drag on the sphere as a function of the flow rate, the drag decreases by a small amount from six down to four. Um, however, we've normalized the drag using the steady state viscosity. And if we were going fast, that's wrong. It wouldn't have time to build up to the steady state when we should really use the smaller viscosity, the initial early time viscosity, and therefore we should get a lower drag. So that explains why the drag goes down a bit. And what do experiments do? Well, the experiments, if you look very carefully, do have a decrease in the um, uh, drag. And experiments also have an increase in drag, and we can't, we're not predicting that. So again, it's a 50% success rate. So there is a tiny decrease in the drag, and there's no big increase. And worse, this model, simplest possible model, the old Roid B, simplest model uh, ela viscoelastic material, doesn't have the big wakes behind the sphere. Okay, you can actually, with this, um, s these ideas, understand now the negative weight. So I said that as the sphere moves along, there's material going backwards. Well, let's go in the other frame. Think of the material starting unrelaxed. It comes around the sphere, the uh, fixed sphere, and it gets stretched. And uh, it, it's stretched, and it's going around fast. So it's quicker than the relaxation time. So it arrives downstream stretched. So it would, re unfortunately, there's no, the momentum equation says, I don't particularly want it to be stretched. I, I don't need this stress here. This is a f uniform flow down here. And so as you've got an elastic stress, what it does, it kicks in a negative viscous stress so that the total stress is near enough zero. So we want a viscous stress which is neg negates the unrelaxed elastic stress and therefore we have a flow in the wrong direction. We have a negative flow to give us a negative viscous stress which cancels the unrelaxed elastic stress. So that's waving my hands. You may not believe that. So actually we can go into the computed solutions and ask exactly what are, are the elastic stresses and the viscous stresses and what they're doing at different places. And that explanation, um, uh, it did take them about five years to dig through their computations and they eventually agreed with what I'd been saying for five years. So that was one of the cases I've made a prediction in my life that's been correct. Okay, so I've talked at the moment about some, uh, the, uh, the linear response. We're now going to wind up to slightly nonlinear behavior, uh, the first nonlinear effect. So slightly nonlinear effect is also a universal behavior. It doesn't matter that whether you have the simplest possible model or more complicated models. They all have rough, roughly the same um, slightly nonlinear effect. And to understand, that w what is the slightly nonlinear effect? It all comes down to tension in the streamline, something you don't have in viscous fluids, but you do have in these viscous, viscoelastic fluids. So I hope you're familiar with the idea we can break shear flow, simple shear flow, 
into pure extensional flow plus rotation. So if we add the sideways flow there to the sideways flow there, we get the sideways flow there. Um, if we add the up flow there to the down flow there, we get the zero up and down flow here. So that, that's pictorially representing the decomposition of a velocity gradient into its symmetric part and its anti-symmetric part. Now, if we think what happens to some microstructure that starts isotropic, spherical, be take a think of a spherical drop here, in this flow, it will get stretched out to here. So that is a, a shear stress, because I'm transmitting across this boundary a force in that direction. That's what sh a shear stress is. If I now, that's the linear response, the first response. If I take that and think about what the rotation does, so it's a quadratic response, I will rotate this around to this orientation, which means I have a f I, I'd like to resist being deformed, and I'm resisting by pushing a, in the direction of the streamlines. And they, they're called, they're technically called, they're called normal stresses. They're called normal stresses because they're orthogonal to the strain rate, and therefore they do no work. But they do dynamics. So th this is just a name. And I, I'm afraid I might use that. I, it would be better if I called it tension in the streamlines. Okay, so I, I talked before about what is the value of the shear stress, and it's the shear rate times how long you can remember. That will give you the deformation we've got here, the rate times how long you can remember, and then we multiply by an elastic modulus. So this is the size of the shear stress, and then if we rotate that around, we do the same trick. We say, we, how long can we remember that we've been rotating it round? Well, it's the rotation rate times the memory time, so it'll be gamma times tau will be the amount of the, the shear stress that gets rotated round. So our tension in the streamlines is going to be quadratic in the shear rate, which is very important because it's going to be the same if we shear this way or shear that way. We want the same tension pulling in on the streamlines. And tension in the streamlines explains a vast number of phenomena. So these are new phenomena to be explained, and I'll go through most of them. So there's lots of things which have a simple explanation in terms of just thinking about the tension in the streamlines. So there's this experiment. So there's a, rotate, there's a, a bath of uh, liquid, a, a container of liquid, and there is a black rod there, which is rotating. Now, if you put a rotating rod in water, it will um, drive the water to circulate around, and through inertia, it gets flown out, and you will find the free surface is a parabola. These viscoelastic liquids, and egg whites do, does this. If you can, in the kitchen, get a beater without too much complication, and you put this into egg whites, you will find it, it will climb the beater, just like this. And the explanation is there is ten, there's shear flow here, a lot of shear flow next to the rotating rod. Next to the rotating rod, we have these circular streamlines. They are in tension, so they're squeezing in. So they squeeze in, and it produces a hoop stress that a curves, cur an object in tension will produce a force inwards, a hoop stress, and that will squeeze the fluid in, and it's got to go somewhere, it will go up. And it goes up to such a height so that the pressure drop from that height is enough to push out and balance this squeezing in. Here's another more complicated uh, flow um, you can't do in the kitchen. So again, there is a rotating rod with a sphere on the end of the rod, and it's rotating around and we're releasing dye here, and you can see the dye is coming in and in. If we did with this with water, um, the dye would, uh, the f there's a flow that through inertia is thrown outwards at the equator, and so the dye would just spiral out. But you can see in this material, the dye is spiraling in. And the explanation is the same, that there is shear um, near this sphere, 
and therefore the streamlines are in tension. The tension in the streamlines is uh, driving the flow in. So there's a tension in the streamlines. It produces a hoop stress that squeezes the fluid in. Okay, so there are two examples there. The rotating rod where the, and <coughs> it climbs the rod and here where the secondary flow comes in. And in both cases, it's precisely the opposite to what happens due to inertia. Centrifugal forces in rotating rod will throw the material out. Centrifugal forces in this rotating seal will throw the fluid out on the equator. And that's the thing to learn, that the non-Newtonian effects are precisely the opposite to inertial effects. If you know what a little bit of inertia does, you can bet that um, non-inertial, non-Newtonian complex fluid elastic effects will be precisely the opposite. Okay, so there's another little example. There's some particles here in a shear, and in time they form chains. And it's this same old explanation that there's tension in the streamlines. There's, there's a particle. It's in. It's a particle here. It's in a shear flow, and so there's tension in the streamlines around. So if we have two particles next to one another, there's tension in this street in the streamline above, and tension in the streamline above, and the bent. Um, streamlines in tension will just pull the, s s the s particles together. So the particles are squeezed together. There's a problem that I, I had from uh, an oil company that in hydrofracking um, you squirt liquid into geological formation at a higher pressure than the geological pressures so that you can break open the, f the geological structure. Um, and uh, that's fine. The, 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 once you've not got a nice crack, the oil will flow into the crack rather than coming into a, a little circular p hole that you drill. So you have a bigger s production area. Unfortunately, when you take the pressure off, um, the crack closes. So what you put into the hydrofracking liquid is some, uh, some peanut-sized particles, and they will keep the crack open after you take the pressure off. And then suddenly the company realized that their carrying liquid was a complex liquid, and they said, what does this do to the particles? Where are the particles going to go? And the answer is they migrate to the center of the tube, which is good because it means they take it furthest down the crack. Why do they migrate um, to the center of the tube? Well, it's, there's a, posse, a parabolic profile uh, across the channel, across from the, the two surfaces of the crack when you're s pushing fluid down a long, a long crack. And uh, that's, uh, there's high shear rate near the walls. So as a particle near to a wall will have a more tension in the streamlines on the, on the side near to the wall than the side away from the wall, the more tension on the stream on the uh, side near the wall will push the particle towards the center. Okay. So there's a simple explanation of something that was worrying that company. And we can go back and do a full numerical calculation and get exactly the numeric. We can get the numerical numbers multiplying the scaling argument. We can construct there. There's also a phenomena of um, in these viscous liquids. If you'd have a rod, have to do as a rod. Um, sedimenting. It doesn't sediment vertically. It glides slightly sideways, but. Um, a symmetric rod at zero Reynolds number and no elastic effects will preserve its orientation. It, there's a reversibility that uh, Ganesh had described earlier, which means that it won't rotate. However, a bit of inertia will make the rod rotate to the vertical. That is because the streamlines around the ends, the flow is higher there, the fl flow is Inertia will make it go horizontal. The, um, the uh, higher flow around the ends means there's lower pressure. Lower pressure on the ends will pull it till it's horizontal. So inertia makes, small amount of inertia will make, turn the sedimenting rods to being settling horizontally. In the elastic liquids, it's going to be precisely the opposite phenomenon. The curved streamlines are in tension. Elastic 
the tension, the elastic tension in the streamers, and they're going to push the end. Sorry, they're going to push the ends, and if I push the ends, it turns vertically. Okay, here's a useful phenomena. That um, if this is a Newtonian high-speed jet of water, and you can see the spray coming off. If we add a small amount of polyethyl oxide to the water, we, uh, 200 parts per million, you can see that there's no spray. So we've stabilized the tension in the streamlines near the surface, adds to the surface tension, and it stops the spray being formed. And um, uh, this is uh, very useful for fire hoses. So there are two types of firefighting. Um, there's the firefighting out in the countryside where the brush around you, the tree, vegetation around you is on fire and you'd like to save your house. For that you want spray, you want to cover the, your house with water which will then sit evaporating and your house will sit at 100 degrees, which is safe, it won't combust at 100 degrees. So you want spray to, to coat all the house. On the other hand, for high-rise buildings, it's not that are on fire inside, it's not useful to, to put water on the outside. You want a focused jet with no spray that will pierce through the windows. And at one stage, the New York Hired Department, Fire Department were using this material to try and get more focused jets. I don't know what they're doing now. There's also a, um, uh, there was a very nice possible explanation where the American Senate is full of dim people, so we, we don't have it. So when an aircraft crash lands, there's cracks come in the wings, the wings are full of fuel, and the fuel jets out. It then turns into spray. If we were to have this stabilization effect, we wouldn't produce spray. We just have jets. Now, jets will burn, that's not a problem. The problem is if you produce a spray, it is an explosive mixture, and you have an explosion. So, the idea was to put into kerosene, air, air, uh, air, aircraft kerosene, a small amount, a few hundred parts per million, of some magic liquid, a ma magic substance, which would stop the formation of spray if an aircraft crashes. So they actually had an experiment where they did they added the material and they crash landed by automatic control an aircraft um, into a, a side of a building so it really did crash and out came the fuel out came their jets it caught fire and there's a big fireball and that was a success for the scientists unfortunately the stupid senators thought this was a disaster see they couldn't realize that a flame doesn't burn you much you can walk through a flame it's very thin flames are and don't stay in it but just walk through it and you, it's safe an explosion you can't stand it will knock you over and, uh, if the pressure is too high on one side the other side it will squash you i mean there was no explosion but the senators didn't understand that so we don't have it you have to get the U.S. to agree because we have to have this modified fuel in every airfield in the world. Okay, so having said that there's stabilization, there's also a phenomenon of destabilization caused by the tension in the streamline, and this is in co-extrusion. So we recycle a certain amount of plastic. Um, this means you've got junk plastic that you're going to give to the customer. They don't like junk, so you have to coat the junk plastic with some fine, high-quality plastic. And then they believe that it's nice. So we're into co-extrusion, putting a coating on. <coughs> so an idealized case. Here we have a core with junk plastic in, and here we have a coating and the annulus outside of um, high quality. Because it's high quality, it has a greater tension in the streamline. So here we have high tension in the streams, here we have low tension in the stream. And while this interface is flat, the dis discontinuity in the stress tensor is not a problem because it's sigma i j n j, sigma dot n, which has to be continuous. And uh, for an n in this direction, it doesn't pick up the sigma z z. 
However, if we do perturb the surface, things go wrong. So if we perturb the surface like that, then the high tension on the outside will pull this this way. The high tension on the outside will pull it this way. The high tension on the outside will pull it this way. So we've got these forces on the surface. Those forces now will um, generate a flow. This force will generate a flow here. This will generate a flow here, similar underneath. And then these flows coming together can have to go somewhere. So these flows have to go down and we have to go down there to fill out there by conservation of mass and therefore we are going to move, perturb, increase the perturbation. And this, is, this perturbation is a real problem in co-extrusion. Okay, so I've talked about virtually all of these. I'm not going to talk about the Taylor quit unless asked a question. So, tension in the streamlines is a very powerful way of understanding these strange flows. Okay. So, now I'm going to get, there's just a little bit more mathematics going on, not much. Um, so, I'm interested in, so far, I've been, it's, okay, so far we've been looking at linearized and the first nonlinear correction, small nonlinear term. Now I'm going to jump into grossly nonlinear. So when it's very gross, when it's nonlinear, I'm saying it's very fast. It's fast compared with relaxation time. So if it's fast compared with relaxation time, I'm going to forget those the relaxation terms and just think about what is pure deformation of the material. And the answer is, if I'm going along slow here and fast here, I probably stretched it in between. And with that hand-waving argument, we can see that there's a solution of um, uh, this um, uh, equation, which is that just u times u. If I put u in there and u in there, I get the u dot grad u. So that um, uh, this is a, um, a solution of that rapid stretching where the, there's no relaxation. It turns out to be, there's other solutions, but this turns out to be the interesting s solution of three possible solutions. And um, this, because the deformation is in the direction of the flow, is again a tension in the streamlines, but it's a very nonlinear tension in the streamlines. Um, the, the function g depends on the streamline, and you find it by a mathematical process of matching um, into a region where it is, uh, the flow is slower. So it's determined from the, the source region where it's slower. Okay, so if I think about the momentum equation without any inertia, um, and if I really say the viscous stresses are not important, it's, I'm, I'm trying to understand elastic stresses um, when the stress is tension in the streamline like this. So I'm going to s just say the stress is this, I'm going to substitute that's uh, deformation A into there, and then take the divergence. What equation do I get? There's a pressure as well. Um, I get this equation. So I, I need to differentiate U, and um, I, uh, I've differentiated one U and not the other U for some reason, and uh, I've decided that G doesn't vary in the direction of U, so I can put half of it inside. So I get a, a g to the half u, g to the half u. I like that symmetric form. And it, that actually is a well-known equation in fluid mechanics. It is the Euler equation for g to the half u. So many people know about the Euler equation. Uh, in this, so for in a very fast regime, the flow is governed by a, uh, the Euler equation except the inertia terms are on the wrong side. So it means that we get Bernoulli, but we get Bernoulli with a minus sign. So in a normal, um, uh, in a normal liquid, uh, the Bernoulli will say P plus a half rho U squared is constant. And we have, where the flow is faster, we have lower pressures. Here we've got the opposite. We've got a minus sign. So because of the tension in the streamlines, where there's flow, we have higher pressures. 
And this is what I said early on when we were first discussing uh, tension in the streamlines. If you know what inertia does, complex fluids do the opposite. There's the reason, there's a minus sign. So if you're interested in flow over an air foil, foil, and this was done as an experiment, flow, this is foam, which is a complex fluid, going over an aerofoil, you find that you don't have lift, but you have a force in the wrong direction. You might like to know about that if you're designing propellers that mix a fluid. If you're the design feature, you better get the lift in the right direction. So that's a curious thing. Okay, so just a fraction more of um, uh, mathematics. Uh, because it's or the Euler equation, there are potential flow solutions which may or may not be interesting. They are actually interesting, potential flows. Uh, at very elementary fluid mechanics, you come across potential flows. Um, and I can be interested in flow round a sharp corner, a 90 degree flow round a sharp corner. I would, uh, I know my complex variable theory, so that is the potential. I can take its gradient. I can then evaluate the stress, and I find the stress, there's a stress singularity into the corner, which is a very strict power. A vi Newtonian viscous fluid has a strange power law of 0.4. 455, I think, is a solution of a transcendental equation. Here, there's a very simple two-thirds law has come in. Uh, and a little more complicated is to find out how the flow, the stream function, so the flow would be the five-ninths power of the radius. You may want to un understand what the singularity is a sharp corner is if you're building an advanced numerical code, because it's bad to have a finite element method that ignores the fact there's a singularity because then you will get larger errors than second order errors because of the singularity. So if you know what the singularity is, you can build it into the numerical method and then you can preserve your second order accuracy. Okay, so I speculated this, um, uh, what, 20 years ago? Gosh, is it 20 years ago? Um, and uh, since that, um, uh, it has been found brilliantly um, so this is 10 years ago. Um, here is the stress going into the corner, and you can see there's a s power law, where, and it happens to be the two-thirds power law for the stress and the five-ninths power law. So these strange power laws are actually true in some computations, which didn't have a stress singularity, so they, so they go a bit wobbly into the far corner. Okay, um, remember the capillary squeezing flow? Um, it's one of those flows where a very simple, it's possible to make a very simple mathematical analysis. So I'm going to do it. So I'm going to solve for the differential equation here in front of your eyes. Um, so it, the equation, governing equations are horribly tensorial and things like this, but we can cut all that out and deal with the important bit. So, the phenomena is that there is a cylinder of liquid whose radius is going to be decreasing in time, and it's decreasing, meaning it, the, the column is getting longer. There has to be a strain rate, which will be varying in time, and it's due to the action of surface tension. We had in this subject, there's a major problem. What, var what variable do you use for surface tension? Most surface tensions are gamma, but that's used for shear rate, or sigma, but that's used for stress. So I'm running out of symbols, so I've chosen, and uh, my choice is different to everyone's choice, chi. So first equation is E, mass conservation. If you're stretching it, the radius goes down. So this is the speed at which the radius goes down is due to stretching. That's just mass conservation. The momentum equation, there's no inertia, is that the capillary pressure, that surface tension divided by the radius, capillary pressure squeezing in, has to balance a viscous stress, and when you do things carefully, you get a factor of three rather than two, and then you have the elastic stresses, my elastic modulus, and the um, deformation in the axial direction. There's a bit of deformation in the uh, radial direction, which uh, should, has to be there if you do things tensorially correctly. And then I need, how does the microstructure change? It gets stretched by this strain rate. This strain rate will stretch 
the um, uh, microstructure, and it would like to relax. And now what I do is I ignore the gray terms. So I'm only going to have this part of the elastic stress, not this part. I'm going to ignore the viscous term. I'm going to ignore, I'm going to say the deformation is rather large and I f can forget one. And if you do that, there's a very simple solution, which is that the radius decreases exponentially in time with a rate being, uh, the time constant being three times the relaxation time. So, what, re what happens in practice is there's an early stage where the viscous forces is important and elastic stresses are zero because we started from an undeformed state. But once the, elastic, once the viscous stresses have come round and stretched us enough, once the deformation has been stretched enough so that this elastic stress can balance the capillary stress, then there's no need to have any viscous stress. So we, s we arrive at an equilibrium between capillary pressure and elastic stress. And then why do anything? Why have any flow? Well, you need some flow to stop the microstructure relaxing. So we really want E to be um, 1 upon 2 tau. Well, unfortunately, because you've got a bit of E, the radius is going to decrease a bit, so the capillary pressure is going to increase a bit. So to correct for all that, instead of having um, uh, two, you end up with three. So you have to just work for that. Okay. So the early time is all con depends on the, s the magnitude of surface tension. The viscous behavior for water depends on the strength of surface tension. This doesn't know about surface tension, it doesn't know about the radius, it just has a relax, it just has a decrease, an exponential decrease in the radius that depends on the molecular relaxation time, and th which is of the order of seconds, remember, and therefore it, these threads persist for times of seconds. Okay, so I've explained that. Um, so, there is a problem that the radius decreases exponentially, which means it never gets to zero. So, it doesn't break, where real ones do. So, here's some experiments by my colleague Malcolm Mackley in Cambridge. Uh, that are ah, after magic liquid one, there was silly liquid uh, one from Strathclyde University. And it was silly because it phase separated all, most of the time. So, you didn't have a material a stupid fluid. But never mind. Um, so Malcolm measured m the relaxation time. Actually, there's a spectrum of relaxation time, and you have to generalize what I've said for a spectrum of relaxation time. And that's why the blue prediction here of the old droid B um, is not a straight line. It's an exponential. It's a sum of exponentials, and therefore yeah, there's a slight curvature here. This is the last, the slowest relaxation time over there, and you can see I've got the, t from the measured relaxation times, I can predict how the radius decreases in time. I've got the right time scale. The experiments go to zero about here at, 20, at 17 seconds. So we have um, the correct time scale, but we don't have the breaking of the filament. Okay, the M1 um, uh, uh, the, the M1 uh, project, um, this is the mess of uh, extensional viscosities. These are the eight different flow types which were analyzed. And with my student, um, Robert Keeler, we went and looked at each of these flows in detail. Not the data they reported, but the, the real hard laboratory data, what were they actually measuring? They interpreted it as a, an extensional viscosity, which was a, a mad interpretation. So we went to find the source data and then to try and reinterpret it. Um, and uh, from the flow data of M1, we knew the base viscosity, we knew the elastic modulus, we knew the relaxation time. This is from shear flow data. And then we went to these um, uh, different flows and uh, the dots are the experimental measure and this curve is our prediction of how 
the um, uh, height of an open siphon also uh, depends on the radius. It's how the radius depends on height. The open siphon is that um, you suck some fluid out of a tube and then you lift the tube out of the liquid and although there's no tube the, because of elastic forces, the liquid continues to rise up through free air in and goes into the tube and goes round the tube and empties the vessel. It's called a, and this is the shape of that the radius as a function of height. We could predict that from that those values of the parameters. The spin line is, um, is the nylon thread production where you make a thread by coming through a nozzle and then you wind it up on a roller which is going very, very fast. How does the radius vary with distance? And again, sorry, these are not very good quality data. There are some experimental data and there's our line uh, predicting that. Um, there's another, the falling drop and the falling bob. And again, we can predict the, what was observed, how the displacement varied with time, um, rather than the interpretation that they put on the displacement as a function of time to give an extensional viscosity. So we can uh, predict the behavior of M1 fluid with this simple model. OK, so at this stage, this, this is not the end. This is a sort of conclusions um, some way through, how successful has Oldroyd be, be? How successful has it been? So in blue, we have the successes, and in red, we have the failures. So this is the simplest model that has viscosity, elasticity, and it has the relaxation. So the M1 project, big tick, works marvelously. Tension in the streamli streamlines, um, Oldroyd B has tension in the streamlines. That, um, explains lots of experiments. In the contraction flow, if you remember, um, it, Oldroyd B predicts a small drop in pressure, but it fails to get the big increase or the big vortices. In the flow past the sphere, we get this, we predict correctly a small decrease in the, in the drag, but we fail to get the big increase and the long wake. And in the capillary squeezing I've just done, we get the long time scale, why it persists for a long time. We can explain that, but it doesn't break. Okay, so it's half successful. Lots of blue, but some red. There's, um, there's one worse thing hiding here, that it's frightfully difficult to compute once the flow, the Debra number is bigger than one, once the flow gets fast. It's extremely difficult to compute with it. And there's an explanation why. So in the hypothetical flow called steady extensional flow, you can't realize this in the laboratory, the extensional viscosity for this material, the steady viscosity, would increase. And then there's another branch where it increases. And unfortunately, at a critical flow rate, which is 1 upon 2 times the relaxation time, there is a negative viscosity. A negative viscosity, if you give that to a computer, you will get numerical junk very, very quickly. It's just numerically unstable. So this is a disastrous model for computing at fast flows. Why does it go wrong? Well, it's quite easy to understand that equation where we had the microstructure deforming with the flow and relaxating. relaxing. You can see if the flow is stronger than the relaxation rate, the microstructure, the solution of the microstructure um, is going to be that it's going to increase without limit in time. The microstructure just deforms and deforms and deforms and you need some negative, oh, it's mad. Okay. Um, what will we do about this? We need to stop this unlimited growth in the microstructure. We have to say there's a limit. It can only deform to a certain amount. And to do that, we go to Feeney, which is the finite extension nonlinear elasticity. I work quite a lot in France. It's quite amusing the ver how the French pronounce Fini. Um, I don't know why we pronounce Fini Fini in English. It's American name, isn't it? And uh, that is to tweak the Oldroyd B by putting a fudge factor F here. So it's, this is Oldroyd B, but I put a fudge F there 
and equally in the stress we have the viscous and elastic stress. The elastic stress has the fudge factor F there and that fudge factor is to limit the deformation. It's set equal to some maximum amount of deformation and then if you take this expression this will sure this certainly does stop the deformation exceeding um, L. Right, so what does that Feeney, how does this modified model behave? If I revisit all of those um, flows, well, um, well, well, what does it do to the uh, extensional viscosity, a hypothetical flow, but um, one we can analyze mathematically? Well, while the old road B went up and then came down here, this one goes up roughly the same and then plateaus at some high value. And it depends on the limit of extension that you're, the limit of deformation you're allowing. Okay, so we have a large extensional viscosity. The, in shear flow, this, this uh, modified material has a viscosity down here, so it has a small viscosity. And that's going to be important that there's a big extensional viscosity but a small shear viscosity. And how does it behave? Well, this uh, red curve here is what Feeney does if I put the limit as 20. It will now follow on this long time, has this long time scale of old roid B, but once the deformation builds up, then it goes over to breaking. So we've solved that problem. Flow past the sphere, these are the Feeney results. So flow versus drag force versus um, flow rate. We see the, the decrease, which we'd understood in terms of using the early viscosity if you go past fast. But then there is, depending on the value of uh, the limiting L, um, you, it goes to a higher drag. And that is what Tam Shrida in Australia um, found in experiments. There's an amusing story here. You'll notice this was published two years after this, after our numerical solution. He had these results for 10 years, but because the only theory available said go down, and his experiments went up, he left the experiments in a drawer. As soon as we published it, real believable reasons why the drag should go up, theoretically, out come the experiments. Now, you shouldn't do that. You should publish even though theory doesn't agree with you. It, it does mean that we had made a prediction in life. Okay, so we then can turn this into something more complicated. Um, the, uh, we get the increase in drag. We can go and look at what is happening. We certainly do get long wakes. These are contours of the stress in the wake. You see very high values of the stress in a relatively thin region. And then before we did this uh, computation, this had been observed so eight years before. Um, in birefringent light, if you, s if you shine polarized light at this and then view it with a cross through a cross filter, um, you don't see anything except where there are regions of high stress. And you can see there is, in real life, a thin layer of high stress. If you tell a mathematician there is a thin layer of something big happening, they say, aha, I know boundary layer theory. I can exploit that. So we then went away and constructed a sort of bound elastic boundary layer. It's nothing like viscous boundary layer theory for regions of high elastic stress, which are very thin. And we called it in honor of this um, um, uh, previous experiment, birefringent strands. So um, roughly it says, don't worry, most of the flow is a boring viscous fluid with the base viscosity, except in the wake you have this very high extensional viscosity. And um, the flow dynamics is flow past, flow in the wake 
outside this thin region will accelerate this thin region. So this thin, this vis highly vis high viscosity region here starts with zero vol vol viscos velocity here and eventually has to go to the free stream U velocity and it gets stretched along here like that. So that's all you have to know and uh, you can then, um, Oliver Harlan, uh, who was, had been, I said my colleague John um, Rallison, um, instead of the dots are numerical solutions which take about a week to get, this is the velocity downstream, the velocity profile um, extending serious non-zero values down to seven, di seven radii downstream. The dotted curve is an analytic solution based on that and this is two sides of A4 paper by hand. So we can construct a boundary layer theory. Um, that boundary layer theory can be uh, the easiest teaching model is, um, uh, is a cross flow. So we can use it in any case where there's a stagnation point. It's out of a stagnation point you find these thin layers of high stress emerge. So one flow is the cross flow. So we have a channel input and a channel output. There's a stagnation point here. There are high stresses generated here. There's a thin layer of high stresses going out. So we have, we can model this as being a low viscosity fluid out here and a high viscosity thread here, which is initially not moving. The flow will be going past it. So what we're going to get here is a parabola flow here exerting a stress accelerating now. And so that's a half a side of A4 paper can predict that. And you can see here, these are in uh, <coughs> near to here. The center line is going very slowly. It speeds up, it speeds up. And in each, the, in the top and in the bottom, either side of this viscous region, you see a parabola, parabola flow. And the dots are um, uh, laser, dop laser Doppler. Uh, right, yeah, but they, the, the dots are experimental um, observations of the velocity and the uh, curve is our prediction. So we've developed a new boundary layer theory for flows with stagnation points. You also uh, see that there's a stagnation point at the back of a bubble and I recommend you to go and get a bottle of shampoo turn it upside down um, and uh, right way up, you will see bubbles go up and at the back there is a point. Depends quite on what the shampoo is. Um, you want one of these transparent uh, uh, shampoos. But it's because there's a stagnation point and there are very high stresses, you could end up with a point, a cusp, at the trailings um, stagnation point. So that was flow past the sphere. The contraction flow, um, these are the best, less, uh, I couldn't afford a big enough computer. So you can see here the Feeney modification prediction of the pressure drop as a function of flow rate, that while it initially goes down, it does turn up. And I did get to one case um, before my computer budget ran out where the, um, these are really are seriously hard calculations. Um, where the drag had increased. So we, we, we've corrected the failure of the old roid B there. In the experiments, I do admit it increases, the pressure drop increases by a decade, and we've got to 10%. We'll do better one year. So we get the increase. We also get, rather nicely, the big upstream vortices. So here we're getting a big vortex here upstream compared with a viscous liquid which would have a recirculating zone there, a Moffat eddy. So the numerical method we use here is finite element but Lagrangian finite element. If you have fixed finite element, the stress equation is a purely hyperbolic equation and you produce massive numerical errors um, on a fixed finite element. If you if you allow the f elements to flow to default 
to flow with the flow, to, to, to move with the flow, Lagrangian finite elements, they will deform with the flow. It turns out the deformation of the triangles is exactly the deformation of the microstructure you're trying to calculate. So you don't have to work out the velocity gradient and integrate it in time. It's already done for you by just asking what the deformation of triangles is. It's a fantastic and good method. So the only issue is to regrid from time to time. So that's the method we use there. And uh, here's the experiments with the large upstream eddies, about the same size as our computations. Okay, and um, uh, given that there is this flow here with a thin cone, we constructed, there is a, it, people have tried this before and they called it a wine glass effect. It's not a wine glass, it's clearly a champagne glass. I prefer champagne over wine. So th this is our simple mathematical model coming to the end of this lecture, is that there's a stem where there's flow through there and there's recirculating eddies like that, and the flow and the stem is fed by a bowl. And then we model the bowl by a, um, uh, a as a point sink. That will do. Um, uh, and you can calculate what's happening in a in a um, three-dimensional sink flow and decide that nothing much happens, you don't stretch things unless the Debra number is fast. One of my problems on a previous slide was that I didn't get any serious things happening until I went to quite a high Debra number. And this is the explanation that in that um, entry region, in the bowl region, I don't um, I don't get to the full stretch which I really need unless the Debra number is high enough. And that estimate is just right for that numerical calculation we made. So in the stem, which is the more interesting part, um, you have to balance a high extensional viscosity with the variation in the um, radial direction with a shearing viscosity for variations in the angle. So as you come across to this outside region here, it's shearing forces that are doing it. And you need a balance between the extensional uh, forces and the shear viscosity is using a shear viscosity and an extensional viscosity. And because the extensional viscosity is much higher than the shear viscosity, the only way we can get a balance between that and that is to have a very small angle. So this stem converging angle has to be small. It has to be small by the square root of the viscosity ratio. And this um, uh, speculation was correctly, uh, was checked out by um, not a, a, an elastic liquid, but a suspension of rods, where, which where it does have a very clear extension of viscosity and shear viscosity. And uh, Michel Quatre in Paris um, found that the cone angle varied with the square root of the viscosity ratios, just like that, experimentally. So experimentally confirmed. Okay. And th the important thing to learn is that there's a material anisotropy. There's a difference, a big difference between extension and shear. That anisotropy of the me medium is being reflected into an anisotropy of the flow. I have, I have a few minutes, okay. in which case I, I can explain this strange uh, abbreviations, TDR. TDR stands for Turbulent Drag Reduction. There's a phenomena, if you put a few parts per million, few parts per million of high molecular weight, molecular weight of 10 million, into a turbulent pipe flow, the drag will halve. Now, turbulence is a robust flow putting in one part per million, trivial, per minute perturbation, how does that work? It's, it, turbulence, if you give a 10 to the minus 6 perturbation to turbulence, you would see no change at all. Well, the reason why a small quantity um, uh, has a big effect is that the polymer molecules um, are actually long chain molecules, they start life as a coil, and the coil has um, sort of 1% uh, solids, that is mostly made of liquid, this coil. So suddenly I've made life 
I'm 100 times, the concentration 100 times bigger. When I stretch it, it turns out that I need, um, that the behavior, the impact on the flow, is proportional to the stretched length cubed. So I stretch it by a factor of 10. I've increased it by the effect by um, a factor of 1,000. So I don't have to do much stretching of these coiled polymer molecules before suddenly I've got elastic stresses which are serious and enough to change the turbulence. Now some very great people like De Gen have speculated on how this works and they're all wrong. <coughs> Most false explanations of how turbulent drag reduction works say it's a reduction in turbulence. I suppress the turbulence. This is not true. In the experiments, the axial velocity fluctuations, the level of fluctuating velocities, remains constant, even though the drag is halved. So you have to change the momentum transfer. So you have beddies transporting momentum from the wall to the core, or from the core to the, to the wall. That's drag. The, the velocities are unchanged, but their efficiency at transporting momentum has been halved. And that's due to anisotropy. I can make my eddies ani an, anisotro an isotropic version of the original ones, and I can cut the momentum transport. Okay. Not many people have fully come round to my sensible idea yet, but I, I'm used to it. It was very frustrating in the early days when I was working on elastic. It took five years for the other groups in our big European collaboration to agree with my sensible ideas. They did. Okay. So, in other words, there's a health warning on this entire lecture. This is my speculation of how the world works. And not everyone's agreeing yet. In turbulent drag reduction, the, yeah, the, um, you tend to do it a comparison at constant f um, flow rate. The drag goes down for the same flow. The velocity profile changes because the uh, slope of the wall is the drag. But most of the flow is in the plug. And this is used, turbulent drag reduction, is used um, uh, in uh, the Trans-Alaskan pipeline, bringing oil down from Alaska. So actually these chemicals cost you a bit of money. So running costs are high. And the advantage is uh, f for capital cost. During the production of oil, occasionally you have much for some years. You may have more oil than later produced. And you don't want to build an unnecessary extra pumping station. So the capital cost of the pump, an extra pumping station far exceeds the running cost with these expensive chemicals. It's very difficult to do numerical simulation. Anthony Beres in Delaware does have some s simulations. They're very delicate because of the hyperbolic nature. To do turbulence, DNS turbulence, we go to a Reynolds number in for shear flows, go to Reynolds number 400, but then there's this ab added complication. No, yes. So, so experiments have measured velocity fluctuations near the wall and show you um, that. But it would be nice to do a numerical simulation and dig into it. Um, it's not exactly clear what they can, the limit of what they can see. So I should tell you another application of this turbulent drag reduction. Um, again, to offset the capital cost, uh, my friend Robert Sellin in Bristol used it in the sewer system. So you go to an old city, and it has old sewers, and, but there are new suburbs on the outside that tend to feed into the old sewers. And if it's raining heavily at 8 o'clock in the morning when everyone takes a shower, it overloads the sewers, and therefore the manhole covers pop up. So the idea is to increase the flow rate 
for the same head, the same pressure drop. So here's the same pressure drop, double the flow, by p introducing polymer. And the first attempt, he got it wrong. He introduced the polymer. It certainly did speed the flow up, but unfortunately, the fast flow caught up with some slow flow ahead of it, and that popped the sewers. So there was an engineering problem. You have to ramp up the dosage to avoid that disaster. OK, the, the, so now I am getting to the end. Um, uh, the conclusion from the uh, Feeney is that um, uh, we can sort out the problems. With this little tweak of the fudge factor, um, I, in the contraction, I can get pressure drops increasing and large upstream vortices. For the sphere, flow past the sphere, I can get the drag to increase and long wakes. For this uh, capillary, the filament squeezing, I can actually get it to break, as it really does. And it's numerically safe. Although I did say there were thin layers of high stresses, so I have to resolve them. You can't get out of that. But it is safe. There's not negative viscosity. So, um, so it's corrected the failures of old droid B. OK, so th th this is the end. Um, uh, are we, can we now begin to understand the, the, the flow dynamics of elastic liquids? And old droid B does give us an understanding that you're going to get tension in the streamlines, and that explains quite a number of flows. That, that's the best thing. Uh, there is this phenomenon of stress relaxation, which means that the initial viscosity is less than the steady state viscosity. And in a Lagrangian unsteady flow, you may be subjected to low viscosity effects rather than the steady state viscosity. Even though the flow at a point is steady, the um, the moving material sees a low viscosity. And in the uh, capillary relaxation, there's a very nice phenomena where the strain rate is not set by the balance of forces, but is set by the need to stop the microstructure relaxing, which is a different need, and therefore we get a, slow, a much lower strain rate. OK, and th so that's in old Roid B. The Feeney modification introduces two things. One is we do get a large extensional viscosity of a sorts, which gave us the increased drag and the increased pressure drop. And it gives us this anisotropy of the flow. Um, so I think these ideas, these blue ideas, I have derived an, uh, that understanding by looking at a particular model, the old Roid B and the Feeney modification. But I've stepped back from the fine details of what the, is predicted to this generality of what is predicted. And I think those general conclusions are likely to be independent of the model. In fact, I know we have studied other models, and they do the same thing. Numerically at a slightly different position, quantitatively at a different position, but they have this, this same um, flow dynamic behavior. So I think we are beginning to understand the um, flow. And as a final remark is, this behavior is much more than just uh, half of viscosity and half elasticity mixed together. OK, I think that's it, yes. Symmetric simulations, which have stopped that. And then we tend to coax the computation to be steady, look for a steady solution, even if it's unstable. So you are absolutely right, and I understand why, given curved streamlines, at some stage they become unstable. I didn't talk about the Taylor Coet flow, which is the prototype of curved streamlines uh, at sufficiently fast flow, they become, uh, there's a new instability. There, and it, that does occur here, and it also upsets the product that's coming out. And additionally, in this, there's another phenomenon of stick slip. That's different. So, so this is uh, not a very serious question, but uh, 
Around 10 years back when I was following private industry literature, I remember DJM was on one side and the rest of the world was on the other side. So uh, is it now fully established that what DJM proposed is uh, well wrong? In this is wrong. But, uh, he used a sort of, uh, he used an energy argument in a highly dissipative system. So it doesn't go anywhere. He was also into arguing that the turbulent fluctuations were suppressed, which experimentally they're not. Something about six feet kind of behavior, but yeah. you see some kind of behavior in your model, that's from this kind of behavior. Now you have to put that physics into your equations. It certainly is seen in experiments. Uh, there is a s um, if the shear stress exceeds two gigapascals, the liquid won't stick on the surface. And there's a very nice, simple ex So that's the case where indigene is good. Um, it just, just the liquid fails. To, if the shear stress exceeds two gigapascals, it, it will, cannot stick. You're, you're rupturing the molecular bonding forces that stick the liquid to the uh, rigid surface. And so it just slides. So it's not the internal constitutive equation, but it's a new constitutive equation for the boundary of dynamics. Your analogy for tension along the stream line I didn't quite understand the one where in the pipe the particles move towards the center. It seems to me that the streamline that will be faster, closer to the center, and the tension there is higher. Wouldn't that push them out? The tension is proportional to the shear rate squared. So there's high shear rate near the wall, and there's zero shear rate on the center line. I'm kind of, I've seen some papers on periodic box simulations of uh, drag reduction. And uh, they say that dissipation rate, I think, uh, decreases with uh, when they add in poly. So there's bulk people and the people who say, well, walls have some effect. So if you do put in the bulk nimbus strokes, uh, the polymers, will, do you think there will be a reduction in the dissipation rate, the prevalent dissipation rate? Or, or what do you take on that? The dissipation rate is equal to the flow rate times the pressure drop. Normally you don't put a pressure drop, you just put some forcing at large scales and then you see whether uh, the dissipation rate is decreasing. That's a general idea in the periodic box. Okay. I think we did, I think uh, in real pipe flow, not, not in a numerical game, the pressure drop is, the dissipation rate is the pressure drop times the flow rate. And I believe it's all due, the turbulence is all due to the existence of the walls. If you didn't have walls, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have turbulence. So you want to think about the, the turbulence structures near the wall. That's where the production rate is high. What you see in the core is on the whole um, some echo of what was generated elsewhere. So I think if I remember Moulton Landau's 1970-ish analysis of the velocity the spectra in the center core, it's sitting on the dispersion relation of linearized stability analysis. Telling you it's, a, it's not a dynamically key area. The generation is done near the walls. And that's where we're interfering. You've eventually got to transport the momentum in the core to the walls and you're going to go through the wall layer. B model. In that model, the tensor A, is it the strain tensor? Or is it something else? Um, it's a Okay, so if it does, if the material is not relaxing, it is the strain tensor. So it's the integrated strain rate that gives you the strain. But then it's relaxing back to equilibrium. So I like to think of it as the deformation 
of the microstructure and it is symmetric so it is symmetric in a sense uh, so uh, so it, it's integrated the strain 0 to t e dot dt something like that you could you could generate it that way so extension of the or the generalization of the kelvin model of uh, yeah yeah this is the same could call it kelvin or something else model I'm going to call it old droid B. And, I, 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 and I'm happy that old droid B is exactly what I talked about. So there are other things preceding it, um, particularly in simple shear. This is tensorial. Well, not by Kelvin. The other, there are other models. Uh, if you generalize this for uh, linear disk elastic. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot and you can do a general linear disk elasticity lots of relaxation times. Although that tends in practice. So Malcolm Mackley, like, very much got thought that real liquids have lots of relaxation times, which is absolutely true. It turns out that for interesting ex flow dynamics, the longest relaxation time is the only one you need worry about. data quite well. But unfortunately then when you go to another flow it, does, it gives wild predictions. So, and I spent the first 15 years of my career trying to derive the constitutive equations of colloid versions. Um, but I can only do that in highly idealized situations which are of no practical use. So I, kn I know the sort of shape of things that ought to turn up. So that was the idea. You find the, the, general, the general form of the constitutive equation and then go and fit the coefficients in an experiment. But it, it tends to be that you can fit in an experiment with enough free parameters. You may not have understood the material in all its possible flows. Thank you.